In sketch mode, if I hold down the right mouse button, I can easily create new entities like a line. And when I create my new entities, I will automatically get a minimum dimensioning scheme in order to control that geometry. These are known as weak dimensions. You should never leave sketch mode with weak dimensions. There are a few different ways in order to turn a weak dimension into a strong dimension. One way is by double clicking on the dimension and changing its value. Another way is by clicking on a dimension and in the mini toolbar that opens, there is a strong command. Again, you can type in the value that you want. You can also select a dimension and use the keyboard shortcut of Control T. And if you have multiple dimensions that you want to create as strong dimensions, you can select them using the Control key or swiping a box over those different dimensions and using Control T or going to the Operations Overflow menu and choosing Operations Convert to Strong. To control the length of a geometric entity, click on the Dimension tool and then pick the entity with the left mouse button and then locate the dimension with the middle mouse button. Type in the value that you want and your sketch will dynamically update. If you want to control the distance between endpoints, pick one endpoint with the left mouse button, pick the other endpoint with the left mouse button, and then middle click where you want the dimension to appear. But just be aware where you middle mouse button determines what kind of dimension that you get. For example, if I have my mouse positioned over here to the side and then middle mouse button, I'm going to control the vertical distance between those two endpoints. Let me undo that. This time I'm going to do the same thing. Click on the dimension tool, pick one endpoint, pick the other endpoint. This time I'm going to position my mouse up here above the endpoints. And in this case, I'm going to get the horizontal distance between the endpoints. I'm going to undo that one more time. If you actually want to control the slanted length of that line, well, you're just going to click on the dimension tool and pick the line itself instead of the endpoints, and then middle mouse button, and then type in the value that you want. To create angle dimensions in our sketch, we'll click on the dimension tool and we'll pick what we want to dimension with the left mouse button and then position our mouse where we want our dimension to appear and then middle mouse button. And by doing this, I'm getting the acute angle. Angle dimensions are a situation in which where you locate the middle mouse button determines what kind of angle that you get. For example, this time if I click the dimension icon and then pick with the left mouse button the entities I want to dimension, but then position my mouse up over here, I'll end up getting the complementary angle, in other words, 180 degrees minus the acute angle. Let's undo that. And this time when I dimension, again, I'm left mouse clicking the entities that I want to dimension, and I'm going to position my mouse up over here when I middle mouse button. Now I'm getting the obtuse angle, the angle that is greater than 180 degrees. Let's say that my model has a plane of symmetry and I'm taking advantage advantage of that by only modeling half of my sketch. Let's say I wanted to control the angle between the entity over here and its mirrored counterpart. I don't have the mirrored counterpart on the other side and so the trick to getting what's called a half angle dimension is first by putting in a center line and then when we dimension we're going to do three left alternating mouse clicks, either starting on the center line or the angled line. So for example, I can click left, 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 and then middle mouse button. And here I get the half angle. To create a radius dimension, click on the dimension tool and then pick the arc or the circle one time with the left mouse button 
and then middle mouse button to locate the dimension. If you want a diameter dimension, remember that the diameter is two times the radius, so you're going to click on the dimension tool and pick on the arc or the circle two times with the left mouse button and then middle mouse button in order to locate the dimension. If you have a diameter dimension, you can click on it and then in the mini toolbar, there is a tool that allows you to convert it to a radius dimension. Similarly, if you click on a radius dimension, in the mini toolbar, you can convert it back to a diameter dimension. Here I have an arc, and the same rules apply for creating a radius or a diameter dimension, but for the arc, you can also create an arc length dimension. Click on the dimension tool, and then pick the arc itself with the left mouse button, then left click on one endpoint, left click on the other endpoint, and then middle mouse button, and here I have my arc length dimension. If you have an arc length dimension, you can click on it, and then in the mini toolbar, there is a tool that allows you to convert it to the angle instead. Let's say that I intend to revolve this sketch later on. To prepare for that, I can put in a center line for my axis of revolution. And if I right mouse click from the pop-up menu, I could designate this as my axis of revolution later on. If I were to revolve this, I would end up with a hole in the middle of my part. And this weak dimension that Creo Parametric suggests to me would end up being the radius of that hole. But really, I would want a diameter dimension. A diameter dimension is a lot easier to control and inspect because I could use a pair of calipers in order to measure that. The trick to creating a diameter dimension for a revolved feature is three alternating left mouse clicks starting either on the center line or the entity. For example, I can hit the dimension tool and then left click on the center line left click on the entity, left click on the center line again, and then middle mouse button and type in the value I want for the dimension. Similarly, I could start on the entity first and then center line, entity again, and then middle mouse button, change my value. And there I have dimensions that correspond to the diameters of my revolved feature. The minimum required dimensioning scheme for a spline are dimensions for the two endpoints, but you can create additional dimensions to any of the interior points. So I click the dimension icon, pick one of the interior points, pick a sketch reference, middle mouse button to locate, and then you can change the values of the dimensions if you want. There are two other additional kinds of dimensions that you can create for the spline. For the first one, I'm going to put in a center line so I can create what's called a tangency angle dimension. And so I'll click the dimension icon and this is going to be three left mouse clicks. First pick is on the spline. Second pick is the endpoint of the spline. And then the third pick is the center line. And then middle mouse button to locate and I can change the value of that and our spline updates. The last dimension that you have for a spline is something called the radius of curvature. And that one is just going to be a left mouse click on the endpoint, and then middle mouse button, and then you can change the value. Dimensions for a conic. To create a conic, you go to the drop down list for an arc and you choose conic, and you locate start point, end point, and then click again for the shape. I'm going to middle mouse button a couple times to get out of the creation mode. And you'll notice that we have a bunch of weak dimensions. So you have to locate the dimensions of the endpoints. When you create a conic, you're automatically going to get a center line. And so we have some other dimensions that control the angle of that construction geometry. One of the dimensions that is automatic created is the row value. And to understand what a conic is, imagine taking a cone, like an ice cream cone, and slicing a plane through it. 
And depending on the orientation of that plane to the cone, you can end up with a circle, a parabola, an ellipse, or a hyperbola. And so the row value controls whether the shape is one of those different things. If you don't have the row parameter, then you can click on the dimension icon, and then you select the conic and then middle mouse button, and you get the value. So if you enter in a value of 0.5, then the shape is going to be parabolic. If it's less than 0.5, it's going to be elliptical. And about the minimum value that it can be is 0 0.05. Greater than 0.5, it's going to be hyperbolic. If it's an exact value of square root of 2 minus 1, which happens to be about 0 0.4142, then it'll be circular. And if you want it to have that circular shape, you would want to type in the function sqrt2, in parentheses, minus 1. You could add it as a relation, but no, I'm just going to go and change that dimension. only shows two decimal places over here, but that's how you get the circular shape of the conic. But let's go ahead and change it back to 0.5. For the other dimensions that you can create, you can also have the tangency angle dimensions. And that's the same way uh, that you create them for a spline. Again, it's going to be three mouse clicks. You're going to click the conic. You're going to click an endpoint. And then you're going to select that center line and then middle mouse button. And then we can type in our value here, for example, 90. And same thing on the other side. Pick the spline, pick the endpoint, pick the center line, and then middle mouse button and type in the value. Dimensions for an ellipse. To create an ellipse, you have a drop down and you can define either the axis and ends or the center and the axis. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, it doesn't really matter, but you'll notice I locate the center and then I drag out approximately how big I want the major axis to be, and then the minor axis. I'm going to hit the middle mouse button a couple times to complete it. So for the dimensions, you'll notice I'm getting some weak dimensions that are locating the center point of the ellipse, but you also get some construction lines, and you can dimension those. So if I hit the dimension and then pick one of these center lines and then middle mouse button, this allows me to control the major diameter of the ellipse. And similarly, I can pick the other construction line and middle mouse button and control the minor axis of the ellipse. But I'm going to undo that because you can also control the major radius and the minor radius. And to create either of those dimensions, you click on the dimension tool and then you pick the ellipse one time and then middle mouse button. You'll get a menu manager that's going to ask you if you want to control the major axis or the minor axis. I'll click accept and here we have the dimension. I'll type in what I'm going to use for the minor axis and this says this has a capital R and a little a to indicate the major axis. Uh, if I go and pick the ellipse a second time in a middle mouse button now I can do the minor axis and type in the value. For clarity, to show you the elliptical fillet, I'm just going to delete this ellipse. And to create the elliptical fillet, I'll go to the drop down list for the fillet. And you can do elliptical or ellipt elliptical trim. Uh, the difference is with the elliptical, you're going to get some additional construction geometry. And normally, I work with shaded loops, but I have that turned off so I can see these construction lines. And again, if you want to control the major diameter or minor diameter, you click on the dimension tool, and then you can select the construction geometry and type in the values that you want. You'll notice I actually have some weak dimensions in these cases. All right, I'm going to undo those dimensions to show you just like with the regular ellipse, 
you can use the dimension icon and then pick the elliptical fillet and then when you middle mouse button to locate the dimension you can choose to control either the major axis radius or the minor axis radius and it uh, looks like I still had a strong dimension over there saying, hey, you've got a conflict. Uh, what do you want to use? Let's delete the dimension that's already there. And I'm going to use a value here of 25. Similarly, we pick the dimension, the ellipse again, middle mouse button. This time I'll control the minor axis and type in my value. Now let's look at a few miscellaneous dimension types. First up, ordinate dimensions. And ordinate dimensions are very popular in sheet metal. To create ordinate dimensions, first you're going to define a baseline, which is your zero reference. And so I will click this entity with my left mouse button and then position my mouse where I want the dimension to appear, middle mouse click, and I have my baseline created. Then to create your ordinate dimensions, You'll click on the dimension tool and then you'll pick the baseline and then you'll use a bunch of left mouse clicks to pick the entities that you want dimensioned from the baseline. And when you're doing this, there's no need to hold down the control key. Then you position your mouse where you want the ordinate dimensions to appear and you middle mouse button and the ordinate dimensions are created. The next kind of dimension that I'm going to create is a reference dimension. And a reference dimension can be created two different ways, either by a dimension conflict or by manually creating it. For example, let's say that I go to create a dimension and I want to control the length of this line and then I middle mouse click. I get the resolve sketch dialog box because Creo Parametric is telling me that I'm not allowed to over dimension my sketch. And if I have this ordinate dimension here, that's conflicting with having a length dimension for that line. So I can undo what I just did, delete one of the conflicts, or if you hit the dim ref button, it'll turn that dimension that I just created into a reference dimension. And because of the config option, parenthesize underscore ref underscore dim it's going to have the letters ref appended after the dimension uh, if you change the value of that option the reference dimension will appear with parentheses around it besides creating a reference dimension as a result of a conflict you can also use the reference tool and then pick the entity that you want to dimension and then middle mouse click now I have the reference dimension, which is actually the same value as my ordinate dimension on the right hand side. Next kind of dimension, a parameter dimension. And so with a perimeter dimension, you are controlling the total length of a number of entities, and they can be either a closed loop or a partial loop. And when you're doing the perimeter dimension, you're going to have to specify some dimension as being variable so that when you change the perimeter value, that variable dimension changes. And in order to do that, I'm going to take a couple of my dimensions here and then use the mini toolbar to make them strong dimensions because you have to have strong dimensions in order to designate one as a variable dimension. So for creating the perimeter dimension, I'll click on the perimeter tool and pick the entities that I want to control. And again, it can be a closed loop or an open loop. I'm just going to use an open loop and then middle mouse click. And it's prompting me in the message area to select the dimension to be driven by the perimeter dimension. So I'll select one of the dimensions over on the side. You'll see that it says VAR for variable and here I have the value for the perimeter of those different entities. And right now the variable dimension has a value of 13 and some change. If I go and crank up the value of the perimeter, you'll notice that the variable dimension increased in order to have the specified perimeter value. Tapered dimensions are a very specific use case, but for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show it to you anyways. 
So first off, let's say that I use the offset edge command and I actually select model geometry. It's prompting me to select the offset in the direction of the arrow. I'm going to enter a value of one and a line is created. Now, if I select the entity that I just created from the operations drop down menu, you can choose convert to and then tapered. And what this does is it gives you a dimension over on the other side. And that way you could change the value of this to create an offset line that's tapered. The last kind of dimension type is the known dimension. And this one I generally don't recommend using. So let me explain how it's created. So in this case here, I am sketching on a surface in a part and I've sketched a rectangle and it has the weak dimensions that are suggested by Creo Parametric. When I go to create a dimension, instead of dimension sketch entities, I could actually dimension stuff from this model. So for example, I mentioned dimensioning from one side to the other side and then middle mouse click and I get a dimension. And you'll notice when I do that, I also get some sketch references. So I'm dimensioning existing geometry in the model. If I go to the tools tab, I can click on the switch dimensions, which will toggle a dimension from its value to its name, from the numeric format to the symbolic format. And so the dimensions in your sketch start off, let me change that again, uh, with a name which are the letters S and D followed by a number. When you get out of sketch mode, those will just be the letter D followed by a number. But you'll notice this other dimension that I built in here has K followed by D, which means that it is a known dimension and it's a dimension that comes from geometry in your models, not a value that you can actually change. So why do we have the ability to do these known dimensions? In Creo Parametric, you have things called relations, which are just equations or mathematical expressions that relate other dimension, some dimensions in your model to other dimensions in the model. And so it is possible to write relations in a sketch. For example, I might want this SD1 dimension to be equal to the known dimension divided by two. And when I click OK, you'll notice that the value of the dimension updated. The known dimension was 2.9, and now the value of the dimension in the model here is 1.45. If I double click on it, Creo Parametric is not allowing me to change it in the graphics area because it's being driven by a relation. Now, I generally don't recommend that you write relations at the sketch level. Relations are great at the part level. The disadvantages of writing, sketch, write, writing relations in a sketch is first off, it's very hard for someone else to know that that relation exists. And the second reason is that this relation is going to be evaluated when the feature regenerates in the model as opposed to part level relations which regenerate at the beginning of the regeneration cycle. Because of this, you can always end up with a model that has a yellow regeneration status. So in general, I recommend, hey, if you're gonna write relations in your model, which are great, which are incredibly powerful, write them at the part level, don't write them at the sketch level. And so for that reason, Known dimensions are hopefully something that you should never really need.